Hello. My name is Ulrich Heines, one of the organizers of Lockworld. And I welcome you to a session that I have been very excited about from months ago. As, as you have, might have heard, we are planning to do a separate lock world in March of next year, all about Africa, taking a look at the cultural and the language diversity, the opportunities, the challenges. And we thought it might be nice to take an initial look to just give, give you a glimpse of some of the, the amazing things about Africa in a session here at Lockworld 45. I've asked an old friend of mine, uh, Mike Klinger, who is the founder of Enzo Global, and I forgot uh, Mike the second name translation. Uh, I'll let you. Uh, I'll let you say that. He just told me. Sorry, I forgot about language, that. Language translations. Language transactions. Tra yeah. Transactions. There he is. Thanks for coming on. Hey, this is the kind of friend he is. Uh, <laughs> noticing that I'm in need and coming on board. So I've asked a. Uh, Long, a friend from a long time ago who is has been in the business like me uh, doing different things, but he has a background in Africa. He did a Peace Corps service in Niger and has speaks and is just has a, a love for Africa to put together the session and to moderate it. So thank you, Mike, for doing that. I'm going to just turn it over right now to you sure. and okay. let you introduce the panel. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, guys, I'll just give you a, a brief overview um, and then jump in. It's It's been kind of a, so a, one secret was when I lived in West Africa, I learned how to do um, dance, a Senegalese dance, but we're, it's, we're not going to perform that today. So I'm sorry. Um, so Ulrich asked me to, to moderate a panel and he, and he has some interesting people talking about different aspects of the language industry and technology in, in Africa. Uh, just a, an overview, why, in, why Africa? Africa as a continent, there's probably about a billion people at this point and over 60% of the population of Africa is under the age of 25. So that's a group that was born and grew up with a technology uh, right under their nose. Um, it's estimated there's about 1,500 to 2,000 languages spoken in the African continent. And right now, the digital economy in the continent is booming. A NIMSI, a NIMSI survey said that half the, more than half the respondents of North Africa and close to 40 respondents of sub-Saharan Africa um, reported that the lack of culturally and linguistically relevant content was one of the most significant reasons while mobile users choose not to access the internet. So here's one, one component of a, an opportunity. And according to Slater, uh, the, the entire market of, uh, is about 300 million, the African continent. And we're talking about North Africa and, and Central Africa um, and the rest of Africa. In, in, that the, uh, in terms of uh, annual revenue in the US is about 7 billion. So to give you an idea, so it's really still in the early stages. And the majority of LSPs in Africa are probably in the about a 1 million size. So it's not, there's not a preponderance of LSPs at this point in time. And the languages uh, already used are, um, you know, the colonial languages, English, French, and then they have Spanish, Russian, but also uh, Swahili, Afrikaans, Zulu, Amharic, Sosa, Eve tree, Hausa, and Arabic, of course. Um, China has now been a big investor in Africa for the past 20 years. So they're another, um, uh, that's another component. So the need for Mandarin has now become an important part of the business uh, for Africa. Um, obviously, there are challenges for funding, infrastructure, investments. Um, we have someone who who's Nigeria, who's actually having connectivity issues. So Binta may not be joining us today, but um, right now there's a, there's a number of translators got together to form a first African international conference that was held in Nairobi last year in 2019, 2019. And then in 2020, they had a second edition that was held in um, Tanzania. So I'm gonna introduce the first speaker. Uh, Theo Marube, who's the managing director of, of Tamarind Language Services. It's based in Nairobi, Kenya. 
Uh, Theo's been in the industry for 15 plus years. He's one of the pioneers of the Pan-African Masters Consortium of Interpretation Translation, PMCIT, which was hosted by the University of Nairobi uh, and in partnership with the UN, and that was back in 2011. Theo has a team of 10 uh, uh, people coordinating delivery of translation, interpretation, and uh, um, and um, he's working with a network of probably over a thousand linguists at this point. Um, and he's worked with multiple clients within Africa and outside Africa. So Theo, if you could uh, put uh, click on your mic and camera and just uh, give an idea of what you're doing and, and talk about the growth and opportunities you see in your, in your, uh, in your, what you do. Hey, thank you very much, Mike. And uh, good evening uh, from Nairobi. It is uh, 11.39 here. Around the world, uh, Mike, where you are. So thank you so much for that kind of introduction. I am the managing director for Tamarind Translations uh, uh, here in Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, like you correctly said, our language service provider company is called Tamarind Language Services, an LSP, one of the leading LSPs in this region. So very happy to be in this session. So uh, basically, we're doing a, a couple of things. Uh, we uh, started off in 2009 here in Nairobi, but our parent company is actually uh, was opened in Sweden in 1989. So we've been in the African market for about 12 years. We mainly work with uh, the United Nations, uh, like you correctly mentioned. Remember that Nairobi hosts uh, one of uh, the UN uh, headquarters, uh, other than uh, New York and Gen uh, uh, Geneva, of course, Nairobi has uh, the UN headquarters. So we support a lot of the UN agencies for documentation, and of course, run their meetings as well. Uh, 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 currently, you know that there's this uh, popular uh, rise of uh, the use of uh, remote spontaneous interpretation, so we used to provide that. And um, like I said, uh, we've been working a lot using the UN languages, meaning French, you know, Spanish, Russian, English, uh, Ch Chinese. But uh, I realize that we also have a lot of uh, private uh, uh, organizations, especially the multinationals that are coming to Africa. And uh, we're getting an increasing number of requests for localizing content, especially localizing the products into the major uh, languages within the region. So for example, in East Africa, we have Swahili that is uh, 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 in high demand. Uh, we have Amharic that is uh, the national language in uh, have other regional languages, for example, Somalia, where we've had, uh, as you, you may understand, a lot of uh, 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 challenges because of the war. So uh, the World Food Program, for example, has been uh, working a lot in Somalia, and uh, we've been able to, to, to support them in terms of communicating, uh, 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 sort of translating most of the content into Somali language. So uh, communiques, press releases, and uh, manuals for their training. So basically, we work both with uh, the public entities and uh, private uh, entities uh, just to help them communicate in different languages. And like I said, although we've been focusing a lot on the UN languages, there's uh, an increasing demand for uh, local content in African languages. And therefore, I see a lot of uh, opportunities in this uh, uh, field because, uh, uh, like you said, uh, uh, we even have China that is uh, present in Africa, a lot of Chinese companies uh, in the telecommunication sector, for example. So we have a lot of content that, that be, is being localized into most of the major uh, regional languages uh, here in Africa. So very pleased to be here, and I'm sure we can talk more about this uh, later in this session. Thank you very much. Thanks, Theo. I'm just going to introduce the rest of the panelists and you can all join on board. I think Stevi, I'd like you to talk next. He's uh, from Gabon. Uh, he's been as 10 year interpreting experience. Um, he's traveled multiple places. Um, 
He's trained as a TV and radio broadcaster, and he worked as a TV host alongside uh, interpreting for many international organizations. Um, he's been in the voiceover industry, and he created a company called Gemini Multimedia. So he'll tell, to you, tell you a little bit about that. It's an African voiceover casting repository company. So he seeks to empower Africans and emphasize indigenous languages alongside authentic accents in a bid to create employment on the continent. So Debbie also hosts a series of Zoom webinars in which he raises awareness about thousands of online opportunities for Africans as far as voiceovers and online jobs are concerned. So Debbie, you're up. Just give an idea what you do and see, indicate the kind of growth that you see and the possibilities that you see. Sure. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for inviting me to this great event. My name is Steve Vidaeng Jalatotolo from JB9 Mode. As you introduced, I do voiceover. I'm a voice coach, voice talent, voice trainer, and I'm raising awareness to my fellow Africans on the opportunities that exist in the voiceover industry as far as creating media content, creating radio program, podcasts, turning uh, Netflix movies into localized content, and, and so on and so forth. So aside that, I'm also a conference interpreter. I'm a member of the International Conference, uh, uh, International uh, Association of Conference Interpreters, known as AIC. And I'm also a TV host, motiv motivational speaker, and so on and so forth. In terms of opportunities, um, I just noticed that uh, in the voiceover industry, we have so many platforms, hundreds of them, that always look for authentic accents, uh, not really in the sense of mimicking, but being who you are. So if you are from East Africa, North Africa, from Southern Africa, Central, and so on and so forth, they, they want a content that is pure and authentic. I've worked for many companies and many organizations such as UNESCO, WHO, Volkswagen, Solidariat, West Africa, Africa News, you name it. And then what we, we find out is that in the dubbing industry, there's a growing need for IVR with uh, African authentic accent or African languages. And of course, last time I watched TV and I was I was really surprised to see a Chinese um, a TV group called Star Times uh, uh, translating contents from Chinese TV series or soap operas into Swahili from Tanzania. So I, I was really surprised and this is where I got my inspiration from. So I've been organizing a lot of webinars where I, I raise awareness on uh, opportunities that exist online, but more specifically, opportunities that exist with authentic accents, with uh, people speaking just the way they are, because uh, it is true government is really tr uh, really trying hard in, in, in the, on the continent, but internet is giving us more opportunities. You can imagine, for example, we have about 300 P2P voiceover platforms and more than 10,000 multimedia companies looking for voices every single day. I'm part of Voices.com, which is one of the largest voiceover pay to play websites and sometimes I'm just, I just feel tired of apply, applying and just getting more jobs so I'm looking forward to my African fellows to also join that as far as what I do is I offer training sometimes I do free webinars sometimes I do master classes for people who want to get knowledge and to become totally independent make a living out of their voices this is what i'm trying to do and i'm also hoping to create what we call the voiceover academy where i'll be offering not only voiceover opportunities to my fellow africans from wherever they are on the continent thanks to internet the microphone and the laptop but also some kind of repository so in case netflix is looking for a more localized accent a more authentic south african accent of, of a TV series, movies, or, or cartoons, I'll be glad to do that. So I, I think there's a lot of opportunities in that field, but I just feel like I'm all alone out there. I'm doing it all by myself. And in the beginning, I, I was misunderstood because people were like, what are you bringing to Africa? This is not part of us. And I told them, hey, we need your accent. Did you watch the movie Wakanda? Did you see how those Americans, although they are from Africa, but do you see how they, how they, they, they try to get back to the roots? We need that accent. We need that raw, rugged, authentic, 100% pure accent. This is what pays. So this is what I'm, I'm, I'm here to, to talk about. And I really hope uh, I'll be heard. I really hope I'll, I will get the support from those big names, uh, such as uh, uh, bot creators, uh, content, uh, media content, giants to create digital content with uh, African accents. 
and 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 of course to empower uh, all everybody on the continent so that they can also try to make a living. Thank you so much, Mike. I think there's there's more to talk about. <laughs> That's great. Very good, Sammy. It's good to see your excitement. Yeah, there's a lot of opportunity sure. here, and I hope you're going to see everyone's going to see their contact information. So if you need to follow up with people, you'll be able to reach them. Uh, I'm going to introduce Cynthia, and then she'll be the the, the third person speaking. So interesting background. She has a PM certificate of studies from Stanford and a computer science degree from her country of origin, Nigeria. And she worked close to five years with Google as an account manager for Sub-Saharan Africa. And you're going to correct my bio a little bit, but she's currently the lead international product growth for Middle East and Africa at, at Facebook. So she's focused on identifying and executing opportunities to drive growth retention and engagement of users for the Facebook family of apps. That's Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, and Messenger. And it's product areas and, and providing some kind of local perspective from uh, Africa. She's shuttled from London to um, Middle East, North Africa, and the US, so in Lagos. So she's been all over. She's got a great perspective. So Cynthia, you're up. <laughs> Let me just open, turn on your microphone. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mike. Hi, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. I think this is the first time I am joining um, a Lock World conference. Um, albeit today as a panel speaker, but it's so interesting to be here. Um, first of all, you mentioned that I'm Nigerian, and that's something that I hold dear to heart, um, no matter where I am in the world. So I have moved around. But and then moved to um, currently just recently moved to the UN. Um, but of course, whenever Africa calls, um, I'm always interested to have that conversation because this drives um, the core of what I do. So for the past over 10 years now, I have been working in technology and really focusing on consumer technology. Um, as Mike said, I was at Google for a few years and then I moved to Facebook and Almost doing the same thing at Facebook. Uh, one of the things I do is um, to identify opportunities for Facebook across our family of apps in uh, the region. I started with uh, Nigeria, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and then um, also expanded to and as well. You know, with my team. I think uh, for me, what is really exciting about the continent and um, Africa is that is the diversity. I need to talk about uh, the diversity in language, the diversity in culture. If there's anything I'd want you to go back with is to remember that Africa is not a monolith. Um, I think someone told me the other day it's not a mosaic as well, so I'm going to use that word here. So um, as we're talking about Africa, I want you to bear in mind that what, what works for Nigeria might not work for Ghana. Um, indeed, there are uh, solutions that could work across this continent, this country is over 54, uh, about 54 countries in Africa. But um, one thing I want everyone to think about across these countries, or maybe if you look at them from a regional base, so maybe if you're looking at, let's say, Kenya, um, Tanzania, ETC, you might say, okay, maybe Swahili is the thing there as a language. But the thing is that if you think about it, Africa is really diverse as well. So of course, there's an opportunity there. There is lots of opportunity, I would say, depending on what you're looking for. And today we're talking about uh, localization. Um, I think um, I particularly want to say that there are many ways we could um, think about the opportunities that do exist in, in Africa. So one of them being, of course, um, there are many people that are yet to come on the internet in Africa. So uh, companies like ours and, and other technology companies are trying to there are, of course, solutions that uh, could help um, make their everyday life um, easier. So if you think of the solutions that are put out there, um, it's also you have to think of how to bring people to embrace these solutions. Now, if you're thinking about this not, for, not on the internet people, a couple of them are still in the rural areas. A lot of them are still not learned. Um, if you look at the literacy rates across multiple countries, um, it varies at different levels. And you can see that indeed there is an opportunity for us to help people connect to the internet using the infrastructure or using the language and the resources that they are familiar with. So today we're talking about localization, we're talking about language, and I see the opportunity 
they will give you option to use the internet in the language that they are most comfortable with. Um, looking back, you know, at some of the apps that we have on the platform right now, it's on the internet. Um, some of them actually have, let's say, multiple African languages already launched and we're still launching. I remember the last set of app, there's an app we actually launched this year as well, which had um, a few African languages on it. And we're still pushing, we're still looking for opportunities to help people to stay connected and build community on our family of apps using this langu these languages that they are most comfortable with. So I think uh, for me, there is that language um, part in the sense of let's say interaction or helping people even understand how to use these apps. Now there is also language um, that needs to be considered from the angle of you know content consumption. So for example, if I'm talking to I'm I'm Nigerian, I speak Igbo. If I'm reading something on the internet from you know some a friend that's Yoruba, sometimes I would struggle, right? So Nigeria on its own is remote to have I think over 500 languages. I like to keep it safe and say over 200, but indeed I hear it's over 500. Um, so I'm grateful for like translation tools and you know on the feed that kind of make it easy for me to interact with this person I live with, say somewhere in Lagos in Nigeria, who I do not understand uh, their language. And even though I'm here, let's say in the UAE, people are um, writing and having conversations on the internet, thanks to these translation features, tools do exist. So what am I saying in essence? I think um, there's so much that could be done. Um, you could also think of even the contents that people are consuming beyond the ones that, let's say, that, that involves uh, reading and writing. You could think of even movies and, um, you know, some short skits, which are quite popular in the region as well, that people are consuming content in. So this is where people are thinking, you know, um, do we help people transcribe this content? Do we translate as they are watching? Because they would struggle again to understand and have the full context. So I could go on and on in terms of the opportunity, but definitely there is, this is Africa, and as, as it has been mentioned, this is a teaser session. So I'm hoping that by the time you come back next year as well, we can have further conversations on this opportunity. All right, Mike, it seems your microphone is uh, muted. <laughs> That's better. Sorry. Yeah. I can hear you now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was going to say Binta's in the audience, uh, and we don't know how to get her up there, but she's she's also from Nigeria, and uh, she does a lot of work with youth. She's been organizing uh, events called hackathons, Hackathon Hausa, which aims to encourage development of solutions for indigenous languages spoken in the West African region, and as Thea mentioned, there are. Uh, plethora of languages. You can go from one village to the next and there's different languages in each village and then there's different accents. So what I want to open up and ask the, 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 the panel is what, what do you see as the opportunities for technology and innovation in Africa? Where, where do you think they're going and what's the role say of a Facebook or a Google or an Amazon and what's the role of government but just take a stab at that. Where do you see innovation and the opportunities for technology? And Cynthia, maybe you you would start with that since you're you're with one of the big guys. Okay, awesome. Um, well, again, uh, how are this? How are the technology companies investing? Um, I, at least if I go back to think about, you know, Facebook, for example, um, we've announced um, in the last year we've announced. Um, investments in the infrastructure space where we're trying to help people use the internet and have speedy internet and you know hopefully get it cheaper in the long run so there is that opportunity there again like I said there's a lot of people that still need to come on the internet for that but one thing I know is that these companies the te technology companies as you're saying some of them have their footing already in the continent right there are offices that do exist um, and this is because we realize that um, you can't really solve for Africa out in the country to solve for the people. 
Um, I mean, I guess um, if you think about maybe the job that I do, um, I've been fortunate and maybe I'm lucky to be able to still stay connected to the continent and to the country so I can still, as one of my friends would usually say, um, I they feel like I'm more connected to the continent than the people that live in it. And that's because I stayed deliberate about it. So um, there is that opportunity that we're seeing, there's that spread we're seeing from the technology companies and a lot of them are coming into the continent, uh, setting up offices because we know that there is a new wave. In 2050 it said that I think Africa's uh, population is supposed to, sorry, is it, um, if I remember correctly, Popular continents, I think, by 2050. Well, um, it's, a, it's a billion people at this point. Yes, it's a billion at this point. And one way I like to look at it is also India. So look at what is happening in India. In t again, this is in terms of numbers, right? India is also a very diverse country in itself. Um, but when I think about it in terms of in terms of let's say um, the country and how the technology companies are investing there. Um, there is that opportunity, there is that uh, spread that we're seeing with uh, people investment, we're seeing in capital investment, we're seeing in, you know, things that can drive um, the economy growth as, economic growth as well. So a lot of companies are investing um, in people. Um, movement like people in the continent going outside the continent but they're the people that are staying as well and those people that are staying are building innovative uh, solutions we're looking at the likes of fintechs um if you notice and if you've been connected to the startup um, industry in africa you would see that a lot of um, fintechs have been getting the unicorn starters you can see that a couple of them have been getting like huge investments as well there is that industry and that is because again if you think about the unbanked in the continent it's still a huge number so it is a continent that is waking up um you know for the masses and i would say yes there are indeed innovative things already happening but it's waking up so um, but these technology companies are also there to make sure that the people that are waking up have the right to say, um, you know, there is investment, but it's across multiple verticals. Um, it's a case of, the way I see it is that for every solution or everything you can think of, there is a place for it in Africa. So um, if you're looking at exploring the market, Whatever solution it is, all you need to do is talk to a couple of people in the market and find out, you know, what their daily needs is to tailor it to what you have or build from the ground. Good. Well, piggybacking that, Stevie, I wanted, we're talking about technology that Cynthia mentioned, but going into like media localization, which is a whole other area of technology that's exploding in the world. And where do you see the opportunities um, that you kind of alluded to with media, uh, voiceover, dubbing? What do you see there? <laughs> what are your thoughts? Well, Debbie? thanks, Mike, for this, uh, this great question. So much I, I can say about opportunities in the media localization. You know, today with the, with the pandemic, the, there's been a lot of uh, shift on the on streaming devices and streaming a kind of solutions and, and and today i used to talk about iptv that was back in uh, 2016 and people were like the heck is that and i was already watching iptv i remember when i was back in ghana six thousand tv stations and people were like that's impossible i said that's technology so i think mm -hmm. today um the voiceover can can contribute a lot voiceover with professional um, talents, we can bring in for um, TV streaming, series, documents, cartoons, and we can also uh, supply or, or meet the demand of uh, areas in Africa. I think one big challenge is still the cost of the internet and the coverage. And I think our governments really have to work hard on that. And I appreciate where I am in, in Rwanda. Rwanda has done so much because they made internet quite affordable and uh, high quality as well. The other opportunity that I see is also the creation uh, of jobs. Because when we talk about job creation, we put everything on governments. We just believe that we create jobs all of a sudden. I, internet is the solution. And I have one hashtag that I like to use. Internet is the new visa is the solution internet is only the, is one of the solutions that can make africans uh, feel deterred 
crossing the sea, dying in the sea, drowning just because they're looking for greener pasture. I think today, once they have internet and the lab, they have the opportunity to do so. Mm -hmm. The other thing also in terms of opportunity is I think in the voice of the industry, since everything is open, you don't need to fly to go to a studio. Hey, when I came back uh, right here in Rwanda, I started with my with, with my wardrobe. It's it's unbelievable. I remember one of my greatest uh, job was about thirty second for eight hundred pounds, and that was a client in the UK, and, and he never knew I was using a wardrobe. It was just like, what kind of internet is that? I say, well, it's a local internet in Rwanda. I said, oh, what kind of gears? And then I mentioned the gears. I say, wow, impressive. I say, yeah, impressive, but expensive for me because I buy all my stuff from, from Amazon, from, from eBay, and it costs me a lot, and, and customs are very high. So why don't I look at possibilities to facilitate this kind of digital trade, especially when it comes to buying items, and more especially when it comes to pay? Can you believe right here in Africa, we PayPal, Apart from Kenya, that is doing well. PayPal is not allowed. Uh, I mean, in, in, in many countries, and countries are still blacklisted. Skrill, Amazon Pay, Google Pay, Waves. Myth. Let, let's, let's, let's just open the digital world and let's give people the opportunity to work. Because I can guarantee you, once I'm able to put my voiceover academy, create thousands and thousands of jobs, directly or indirectly this is where i see the potential and this is mm -hmm. government should be fully involved mm -hmm. thank you great great um I, I don't know if there's questions from the audience i see qa so i don't know if uh, oksana or someone's gonna clue i just had another question in case there's not i guess i had two questions um one you mentioned you know nairobi a, so there's certain african countries like nigeria like kenya maybe like south africa like egypt that are a little bit more advanced in terms of uh, their technology, their infrastructure, et cetera. What roles are they playing in the language industry? I don't know, Theo, you want to answer that one, but how do you see the certain leader, country leader, Senegal, are they, are they leading the direction or the growth of training, of in investment, of technology? How do you see that? <clears throat> And you're, you're muted too. I think before Theo. Yeah. Yeah, yeah sure, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Stevie. Stevie, you can go ahead. I, I, think the, I think the need, you know, in Kenya, it was a campaign. I remember back in the days when I was still in Ghana, I saw a campaign in Nigeria, if I'm wrong, and people were like, open PayPal in Nigeria. People were crazy because this is a source of income for so many that payment alone, and I think it's just a deal or agreement between countries. It's just a signature. We, we can focus on that. There's, there's, there's a need for political willingness to, to open, you know, that's, that's what I think. The Kenya is doing well. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, indeed. In fact, uh, I was going to say that uh, I'm, I'm very happy to say that in Kenya, there's been a lot that has been done to help uh, promote uh, the, the work that is being done, especially uh, at the technology front. We have a lot of international uh, companies that are uh, tech companies that have uh, worked uh, to help our country have a lot of solutions and uh, we have a lot of uh, local technology hubs and of course most of you may know about M-Pesa, our payment solution that is uh, is renowned internationally. So uh, I'd like to say that uh, Kenya is actually a hub regionally in terms of uh, uh, tech and innovation but uh, like you said Mike, uh, probably look at uh, you know South Africa, Egypt, Kenya uh, in as far as uh, this uh, tech, tech, tech economy is concerned. Yeah? But what I'd like to say is that uh, uh, one of the things that, for example, the Kenyan government has done was to invest heavily in the uh, internet connectivity infrastructure. So our internet uh, speeds are very good. We have a lot of internet service providers, and therefore uh, there's competition, and therefore 
uh, rates. So it's cheap, fast, and uh, accessible, especially on mobile phones. And that has led to a lot of, uh, especially young people being involved in inno uh, innovative, uh, a lot of innovative ventures. Uh, I'd like to say that, for example, uh, our company, when we opened our doors in 2009 here in Nairobi, our biggest customer, actually one of the first customers that we got was Google. Google Sub-Saharan Africa, probably Cynthia, you, you, you may be aware of this. And we worked with Google for up to about 2013, 2014. Uh, we were just not localizing Google products, but we are also uh, working in a partnership to train local translators to do localization using uh, the modern tools, uh, you know, the translation technologies. And uh, uh, I'm happy to say that after that period of about five years, we were able to train up to 30 or 40 translators. And uh, these have since grown to be uh, very, um, renowned translators in the loop. So like Stevie said, technology and localization go hand in hand. And one of the things that I can talk about from the language service provider point of view is that uh, the more we do this, the more people we train and the more we open up the space. And that also leads to, you know, job creation. And uh, I think uh, it's, it's a win-win. So the thing about government involvement, I think, uh, is something that needs to be looked into further. Governments are not aware that there, there's a lot of potential in this field. So uh, you can only imagine what uh, uh, can happen if we have more investment through our universities that will be training more students, for example, in terms of using uh, modern translation technology technologies. And uh, of course, linking that acad the academia to the uh, now the workplace, meaning the, the industry. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of potential in terms of job creation here. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm just, uh, I'd like to say that actually we are only getting started. So I think mm -hmm. there's more and uh, some sort of advocacy and lobbying that can make governments also know, our governments know, that there is a lot of potential uh, in this field of localization, especially if you have to, to see what has been done so far, especially by uh, the international tech uh, companies that have mainly been driving this process uh, so far. Great. Okay, so I realize there's five Mike. minutes. Yeah, so questions, right? All right, there's questions. Yeah, few... we have um, the top rank question is from Eric Falk. In addition mm -hmm. to language, what are some of the regional differences that are critical to consider in evaluating target markets for localization? Wow, Eric, you're not asking for just a little, that's a lot. So, but maybe we can take a quick round and uh, see what sure. our. So, uh, what are some of the regional differences that are critical to evaluating target markets for product localization? It's a good one for you, Cynthia, if you want to start. Okay, sure, I could take this one. Um, Eric, thank you for the question. So I'm going to repeat it. In addition to language, what are some of the regional differences that are critical to consider in evaluating target markets for product localization? Um, so I know we've talked about language. We, we've talked about... But I also want us to still be careful with the region word, right? So. Uh, for example, if you had to ask me, hey, use regions to break Africa apart, I would say maybe North Africa, I would say Francophone Africa. But in Fran with Francophone Africa, you have West Africa there as well. So there's West Africa where um, over 90% of them are actually French speakers. And then you have Nigeria and maybe Ghana, a few outliers there. Then there's Central Africa, you're thinking of, let's say, um, the Lusophones. So that's the Portuguese speaking, which a couple of people do not know that we actually do have Portuguese speaking countries in Africa. Then you're looking at Southern, right? So you're looking at, um, you know, a lot of people still speaking English, but then um, there's still like a lot of local language, which they tend to mix up as well when they talk. So this is, for example, Isuzu in South Africa. And then you talk about um, East Africa, right? Um, East Africa, you're thinking about, let's say, Kenya, and in some cases, Ethiopia would join East Africa, or some people call it a uh, heart of Africa, and then you're looking at North Africa, right, which also is maybe mostly Arabic and um, French, and then there is, um, I think, um, there are, some people actually speak uh, Spanish there. 
Um, but again, so this is me describing the regions and also just saying just it's good to be careful. But now let me compare two countries and please, um, my fellow panelists from East Africa, correct me if I'm wrong. But one thing I understand about East Africa is that, I mean, there. But then if you compare maybe uh, Kenyan's language, which is, um, let's say Kenyan Swahili and Tanzanian Swahili. Um, Kenyan Swahili is um, less formal than the Tanzanian one, for example. So I know you said besides language, but I want to also tell you how different they can be. So in that case, you want to think about tone, you know, for what it means for the people that you are localizing for. Um, do they care about, you know, more structured grammar? in terms of the local language, or do they care about um, the less structured one? Um, the other thing you have to also think about is the literacy levels across. Um, do you want to make it really complex, right? So if you go to West Africa where people speak Pidgin English, for example, I know uh, companies like, so just to, to be able to tackle or help some of people that understand Pidgin alone interact with them. So you also need to think about the literacy levels in designing for, um, the people. So I think if I had to leave with two things, it would be one, um, the literacy level, um, and the other one would be um, tone in terms of how reserved or how uh, conservative the countries are. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Well, Rick, we, we running out of time. Did you want to feel one more or should we wrap up? You decide. Uh wrap up and you know i'm glad we're doing a whole conference obviously there is lots to talk about we just uh, barely scratched the surface so thank you so much uh, to the panel bintu's uh, presentation available uh so people can watch it streaming uh too uh, too bad that uh, the technology did not allow her to participate back to you okay good we'll wrap up and i'll answer some of these questions uh Hopefully, Ulrich, uh, they'll have uh, their contact information so people have questions for Theo or, or Cynthia or uh, Stevi. You know, someone asked about the voice, voiceover samples, especially people who are listening from Africa. There's a lot of opportunity. Right. And part of this is 